You know, I always wanted to be a writer. All my life, I wrote stories and plays and even little personal essays. But I couldn't ever imagine being able to do that for a living. I certainly didn't know anyone who was a professional writer. In my family, it was a very big deal even to go to college. So what do you do when you don't have a role model or a roadmap? My parents said to me, you can be anything you want as long as you can fully support yourself. <laughs> so I decided that I should be a journalist. This was in the late 80s when there were still regular salaried entry level journalism jobs that you could get. Um, and not just that I wanted to be a journalist, but that I wanted to be a journalist in the most exciting and expensive city in America, New York. My parents said, stay home for a year and save some money. But I was young and I wouldn't be told. I had $500 and the promise of a friend's couch to sleep on, and I figured that'll buy me a month. <laughs> and believe it or not, at the end of the third week, I had an entry-level journalism job. It was the kind of job you get when you are desperate, <laughs> a job that nobody else wants on a small community newspaper where they can't keep any staff. And so they'll hire pretty much anyone with two arms, two legs, and a few half-decent clips. By now, I was living in Brooklyn, and the job was on Long Island. So it took me about two hours each way to get to work, which was something I hadn't thought about when I took the job, because of course I was desperate. But I certainly thought about it on my first day when I was late for work. So I get off the railroad, I go running down this long strip of commercial uh, stores, up the steps to the offices of the newspaper, let's call it The Post. And I arrive and I run through reception, the receptionist waves me through, she says, Carl Hefferman, the publisher, who's the man who hired me, has been waiting. And I go running up to Carl's door and I stop. Because standing in front of Carl's door is a policeman. And at that moment, the policeman is slapping a pair of handcuffs on a man and taking him away. And that man is just a few years older than I am. And I look at him, and he looks deeply ashamed. I stood there for a moment. And then Jason, the managing editor, stuck his head out the door and said, oh, Sharon, we've been waiting for you right this way, and ushered me into his office as if it were any other day, and said, uh, you're going to be writing four stories a week, and your first assignment is, and I was going to interview a city councilman that afternoon, uh, and just about that time, Carl, the man himself, walks into the office. He's a man of average height with slightly crossed eyes, and there is about him an air of vulnerability and menace. <laughs> and he says to me, do you have enough money to get you through to payday? And without my response, he reaches into his pocket and takes out a huge wad of cash, peels off tw three $20 bills, one, two, three, does not ask for my answer, and leaves. Now, of course, I needed that money. I took that money. But I had no idea, was this an advance against my pay? Was I expected to pay this back? What was I expected to do for that $60? Uh, now, at this point, a few of you, maybe a lot of you, would have left, right? I mean, you got the policeman, the handcuffs, the mafioso wad of cash. <laughs> But it never occurred to me to leave. I wanted a journalism job. Here was a journalism job. I had no money. I didn't want to go back and live in my parents' house. I could have taken maybe a waitress job or bartending job until something better came along. But the truth is, I'd been working since I was 13 years old. I'd done waitressing. I'd 
cleaned rooms, I'd refinished furniture, I had done it all. And when you come from a blue collar background like I did, you don't really see the romance in blue collar work. So I wanted to use my college education. And most of all, I wanted my parents to see me use my college education. So I stayed. Four stories a week, it turns out, is a lot of stories, particularly when you've never actually written a serious news lead. Uh, and my first few stories were news stories, including one on the foreign aid budget in which I had to interview a lot of local congressmen and senators. Now, you might be asking yourself, what kind of local paper does international news, especially a paper with a staff of about seven summer editors, summer production people, and one full-time local reporter, plus a few freelancers. Well, the Post had this incredible reach. And you really can't get that out of a tiny staff unless you drive them obsessively. The paper was like a religion for Carl and his wife, Leah. In fact, we worked seven days a week. We had no weekends off. I was expected to spend weekends catching up on stories and getting interviews with people I hadn't reached during the week. Um, we also had no holidays off. The paper closed for Christmas one week, and it closed for Fourth of July. The rest of the time, we worked through holidays. Carl also brought his children to the office, and he, would, he had two little girls, four and seven, and he would unleash them every afternoon on my cubicle, yelling, Sharon, don't let them play with any scissors. <laughs> so in fact, I was babysitting after all. Um, but in the end, I can't really blame those little girls for how badly I did that year. I wasn't a stupid person, but I sure did a really good imitation of it at that newspaper. <laughs> minutes, days passed like minutes. We were so busy all the time, and yet I always felt somehow like I was walking through molasses. Uh, there was this thing called The Wire. It was like a primitive internet where we had to pull stories off. Jason gave me a two-page detailed instruction list of how to do it. I couldn't do it, ever, a single time. My news leads stank. They had to be rewritten all the time. And every time I'd say, well, could you show me what I'm doing wrong? Jason would say, well, after we put the paper to bed, when we have some free time. But there was never any free time. Um, the hardest thing, I think, about working at the Post was that you, Carl was a perfectionist, and he had a terrible temper problem. And you can imagine it's 2 in the morning, and you've been proofing for 10 hours straight these long pieces of text. And it's a really good chance that you're going to make a mistake. And if anyone made a mistake, there had to be blame. And Carl would get in your face and shriek and scream at you. Now, it didn't actually happen to me, I think, because I was a girl. He kind of avoided it. He would tell Jason to tell me what a lousy job I was doing and how dissatisfied everyone was with me. But when you watch everyone around you getting screamed at, you know, you can, you're waiting for the knife to fall. And it's a very scary feeling. My favorite person at the paper was our typesetter, Alvin. Alvin was an immigrant from Jamaica, and he was supporting a wife and four children. He'd been with Carl the longest, and it was clear Carl thought, this guy will never leave. When the rest of us couldn't go on on production nights, Alvin keep, kept going. He often slept at the newspaper. If something went wrong on a Sunday, though Alvin was a religious man and lived in another borough, and Carl lived three blocks from the newspaper offices, Alvin was expected to come in and fix it. Um, and yet he never complained. He really always had a smile on his face. And when Carl had hired a director of advertising and then decided after three weeks he didn't want the guy anymore and fired him, and the guy came at him with his fists, that was, by the way, the man I saw being led away in handcuffs. Uh, Carl d didn't r yell for his wife or the police or Jason. He yelled for Alvin. Yet I never saw him give the man a compliment. I never saw him thank him. And if anything went wrong, Alvin was usually the first person Carl blamed. I should say here that my father worked his whole life in a family business for a man with a temper problem. And ironically, he was named Carl II. 
And like Alvin, my father was the longest employee. He had the keys to the warehouse. And when anything went wrong, he was called. He was never thanked. He was often demoralized and treated horribly. And I didn't know this during my growing up because my father never took out his emotions on my mom and me, never yelled at us. I didn't know it till my sophomore year when I was thinking about dropping out. I was really unhappy. And my dad gave me this pep talk and basically told me about how unhappy he'd been for 30 plus years at his job. And he said, I want you to stay in college because I want you to have choices. I want you to have options. I don't want you to be stuck. You see, my father wasn't an immigrant, but he had a high school diploma and a family to support. So you see, when Carl would yell at Alvin, get in his face and scream at him, I would go into the bathroom, sit in the corner, and put my hands over my ears and weep. Now, what do you do when you need another job, but you don't have any holidays or weekends off to make a resume or do a cover letter or even research a new job? Well, lucky for me, my roommate that year worked in a school, and one day she came home with lice, and we were infested, and I thought, this is my big opportunity. <laughs> Because I knew that Carl would not want me to come into the office when his children were there and bring my lice with me. So I called him up, and sure enough, he said, stay home. And we took a day to like scrub and fumigate and do everything we needed to. And then I had four days to come up with a resume, cover letter, send them out, do the whole thing. And in a few weeks, I had some job interviews. And in another month, I had a new job in PR in the city. When I came in and gave notice at the Post, everyone was incredibly surprised. I think they thought I was way too much of an idiot to get anyone else to hire me. <laughs> Carl called me into his office and he said, well, I'm glad you're going to work in PR because you have no talent and you'll never be a real writer. <laughs> and this was not the first time he'd said this to me. And I thanked him and I left. You see, if I hadn't distinguished myself at the Post, I had survived it. And I knew when I left, it was in no small reason because of my dad and because of the sacrifices he'd made for me that I didn't have to stay. Now, the truth is, I learned a lot at that job, right? I learned how to write captions, headlines, do interviews, find my way around with a map. Um, I could type really fast after that being at the Post. Those all helped me in future jobs. Um, and over the years, though, I can't say I never had another lousy boss, um, I found more and more ways to write fiction because the real thing I found out at the Post was I didn't want to be a journalist. You see, I'd always continued to scribble notes to myself on the railroad. I'd always kept writing fiction. It was like a compulsion. And I realized that the things I cared about could not be found in the who, what, where, and why of serious news. I cared about people and the details of personality that often end up being cut from those stories. And so over the years, I kept writing fiction. I found ways to do it. And then many years passed, and I published my first novel, Rich Boy. And I got to tell you, I have had experiences and met people from publishing this novel that I never could have imagined when I was that girl working on the Post. And about a year ago, I was asked to do a book talk on Long Island. And I took the railroad out two to two stops past where I used to drag my ass off that train every morning, <laughs> miserable, fat. I put on weight. I'd broken out everywhere. I, none of my clothes fit, right? I was that unhappy girl dragging my ass off the train. And when I got to that stop, I heard Carl's voice in my head telling me, you'll never be a writer. And I thought about Alvin and Jason. And I wished that I could have talked to that girl, that old me. I wished I could say to her, it's going to be OK. Don't take any of it too seriously. You know, everyone has at least one terrible job in their life. And the world is full of unhappy, miserable people who are going to tell you you will never succeed and you have no talent. They're all wrong. 
Only you can determine your future. Only you hold your destiny in your own hands. Thank you very much.